In the two books that you have written, I have read of UFO inferences. Would you expand upon those things? Yes, well, actually, in the, in the first book, the UFO reference is few and far between. I think it's only touched on once. I deliberately suppressed it from the invisible landscape because I thought it was already lit up like a Christmas tree with bizarre ideas. And I would, I would save that particular ornament for its own uh, treatment later. But in the second work, uh, down to earth, psilocybin and the UFOs, I deal with that uh, directly because uh, it seems to me that uh, in psilocybin and the tryptamine hallucinogens generally, we actually have a uh, state of mind that is very similar to the state of mind reported to accompany the, uh, the UFO contact and that these things could somehow be co-mapped one onto the other, that at, uh, at active uh, levels of psilocybin there is uh, visionary ideation of spaceships, alien creatures, alien information, a general futuristic saucerian kind of quality to the place it conveys you to, that uh, seem to be coming from the same place uh, as the modern myth of the UFO, if it is a myth. And uh, we discovered in our exploration to the Amazon in 1971 that this was quite true, that uh, involvement with these tryptamines, as they accumulated in your system, you seem to acquire the ability to uh, inhabit more than one world at once, as though superimposed over reality, there was a, a super-reality, a hyper-dimensional world where information was uh, accessible in magical ways. And uh, in the wake of that experience, I just uh, went through the literature of the mystical experience and the saucer experience and uh, ideas like alchemy and that sort of thing. And uh, eventually saw that these, they were all talking about the same thing, that there is an experience which is gaining ascendancy for modern man, which is called contact with the UFO. But it is not uh, reducible to any of the things that the... Uh, main people who've written about it have said it could be reduced to. It is not, strictly speaking, a contact from a space-faring race that has come from the stars. It is not uh, mass hysteria. It is not delusion either. There is, in fact, something very odd going on, something which is as challenging to modern epistemological notions as, uh, you know, a uh, U.S. Air Force jet transport landing uh, on some field outside a village in New Guinea. In other words, uh, here is an area that is close to the experience of people, in that a very large percentage of people claim to have seen flying saucers, an area close to the experience of people where science is totally helpless it seems as though reality is haunted by a spinning vortex that renders science helpless. And the spinning vortex is the UFO, and it comes and goes uh, on a mass scale, haunting history like a ghost. Um, you mean the records in the, uh, the Aztec records or the whole thing about um, coming in? the white men coming to the new world and spaceships and Well, all these cases have been made for saucer intervention, but no, actually I'm speaking more specifically of the post uh, World War II spinning silver disc uh, 
in the sky and the myth that accompanies it of the large pointed-eared cat-eyed. Uh, it has numerous variations, but uh, it's clearly an idea complex emerging in the psyche. Of, and the question is, what is it? Is it prophecy? Is it a vision of the human future? What is it? And... Uh, the postmodern phase of flying saucer speculation is the phase which recognizes that the saucer is somehow mixed up with human psychology, that it is no mere light seen in the sky, that when you go back and question the people who see these things, that right before they saw it, they were thinking something very odd and unusual, which they didn't normally think about, or right after it. And in other words, it seemed to be a kind of ideological catalyst for some purpose. And uh, Valet, in a book called The Invisible College, was the first person to suggest what I would call the cultural thermostat theory. He said that the flying saucer was an object from the collective unconscious of the human race that appeared basically to break the force of any, idea, any set of ideas that were gaining dominance in their explanatory power at the expense of their ethical force. In other words, that it was like a confounding which would enter history again and again. When history would build to a certain kind of boil, the confounding would occur. Mind parasites does that too. This is a similar idea, right. And he suggested that perhaps the career of Christ was an earlier confounding where Roman techne and Roman militarism and all these things was unseated by you know, a peculiar religion which no educated Roman could take seriously for a moment. And I mean, an educated Roman was a Democritian atomist and uh, well-versed in, uh, in Epicureanism and Sophism. And, uh, and yet the servants were telling stories about a rabbi who had risen from the dead and had somehow reopened a gate that had been closed since creation. So that the soul of man could again be reunited with God and uh, this stuff made no sense to the Roman authorities and yet it quickly overwhelmed the empire. The modern context is very similar to that in that science now it can be seen to have replaced Roman imperial aspirations as a dominant mythos of control and uh, it has these neat and tidy explanations of the world, yet persistently from the folk there come stories of lights in the sky and strange beings and bizarre encounters that they cannot quite lay to rest. And you and, have experiences yourself. Oh yes, it's a real whatever real means. I mean, it is a real experience. It is phenomenologically real. In fact, my contention is that uh, psilocybin induces it and that perhaps on a mass scale, it, it's as though there is an event at the end of history of such magnitude that it casts miniature reflections of itself back into time. And these are these apocalyptic concrescences which haunt the historical continuum, igniting religions and various hysterias and seeping ideas into highly tuned nervous systems. How does it do that? Well, it's as though, the it's like Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. It does it because in its dimension all these things have, are somehow co-existent in time or outside of time. They have already happened. History is the formality of viewing this hyperdimensional object in a three-dimensional way by transecting it many, many times until you've built up an entire picture of it. But uh, the, you know, the mushroom evokes a profound planetary consciousness that shows you that history is just this froth 
of artifact production that has appeared in the last 10 to 15,000 years spread across the planet very quickly, but that mind in man just goes back and back into the darkness, you know. And one of the things we were saying in the invisible landscape was that there are powers uh, in the human body or avenues of understanding that have not been followed because of epistemological biases so that for instance the idea that you could use your voice to affect molecular changes in your own nervous system it sounds on one level preposterous on the other hand it's simply a formalized way of noting the fact that sound is energy that energy can be transduced in a number of ways and then when you direct it against your body you obviously do make changes well that's the typical chanting uh, that goes uh, on in shamanism time. worldwide. Well, uh -huh. these people are navigating themselves in a space which we have lost touch with, that for us, uh, as a, I'm speaking now as a society, only erupts in the weakened situation of a weakened psychic constitution where there is the element of panic in the mythological sense of pan bursting through from the underworld, the emergence of the flying saucer. What it is, is it's an autonomous psychic entity that has slipped from the control of the ego and is approaching laden with the otherness of the unconscious. So that, you know, as you look into it, you behold yourself, your world, your information field, all deployed in this strange, distant, almost transhumanly cool way which uh, links it to the myth of the extraterrestrial. The extraterrestrial is the human oversoul uh, in its general and particulate expression on the planet which doesn't rule out the possibility that the mushroom places you in contact with extraterrestrials somewhere in the galaxy uh, actually circling other suns but it probably means that that communication is mediated through the oversoul the oversoul is uh, some kind of field that is generated by human beings but that is not under the control of any institution, any government, any religion. It is actually the most intelligent thing on the planet and it regulates human culture through the release of ideas out of eternity and into the continuum of history. And what the UFO is, is an idea to confound and its purpose is to confound science because science has begun to threaten the existence of the human species, leave alone the ecosystem of the planet. And at that point, uh, a shock is necessary for a culture, a shock equivalent to this culture, to the shock of the resurrection on Roman imperialism. And the myths that are building are like the messianic myths that preceded the appearance of Christ. And what they are of is of an intervention by a hyper-intelligent entity that comes from the stars and reveals the right way to live and uh, wrecks science by a series of demonstrations that make it apparent that the purpose of human history is nothing less than total immersion in the teachings of the saucer. And it, once this message is slammed home via worldwide TV hookup and that sort of thing, it will just disappear. And in the wake of that, you see, what you have is uh, this hysteria of abandonment, similar to the hysteria of abandonment that swept the Christian communities when, after the crucifixion, the resurrection, the coming of the millennium was postponed century after century. And uh, so the development of science will cease this flying saucer-oriented religion, which is definitely the emergence of an archetype of enormous power, will hold sway in the same way that Roman science was stymied for a thousand years by the immersion in the words of one, one rabbi. Scientists are not going to like your opinion. Well, they should be forewarned. Valet was saying this in another book of his called The Invisible College. He was more alarmed than I am because he is of the tradition of French rationalism and he was quite 
frightened to think. He didn't believe it was, I should say, the oversoul of mankind. He actually believed it was a politically oriented group of human beings who had an advanced technology that was allowing them to do this. I reject that as total paranoia. And I am not as concerned with him to pull science's chestnuts from the fire. I think that science has betrayed human destiny to some degree and that uh, you know we are led to the brink of star flight but we're also led to the brink of thermonuclear holocaust and uh, but but uh, the conclusion the political implication that i draw from all this is that uh, scientists will be swept away by the revelation of the flying saucer. They have always been the ones to be like the Apostle Thomas and want to put their hand into the wound. And uh, if the wound is offered, meaning if the saucer comes and is seen by hundreds of millions of people, they would go over uh, immediately. Uh, so the political insulation, the political conclusion to be drawn is to preserve your freedom of thought by deconditioning yourself to the flying saucer religion before it happens. Is this, can we because the most uh, inspired scientists might be the most intrigued in this situation. Oh, they would go over first. But you see, a religion operates by a law of large numbers. As long as 80% of the people believe, it can transform a civilization. Therefore, if you're one of the 13% who don't believe, it's okay. So you always want to stand where the high water won't reach. Um, but I, I think that the flying saucer experience is tremendously powerful and that it really is, the, uh, is somehow linked to the psychedelic experience in a way that will not perhaps be understood for some time, but that uh, the futuristic hyperdimensional world of these tryptamine hallucinogens and the persistent message from the unconscious in the form of these spinning idea complexes with the alien creatures inside are definitely expressions of the cutting edge of the evolution of consciousness and it's very interesting a voice has been silent and a voice that guided and revealed has been a silent phenomenon for about 1700 years now in Western civilization. Before that, there was such a voice. I mean, it was called the Logos, and all philosophers strove to invoke it. And it was a voice which told you the truth, the self-evident truth. You had only to hear it, and you knew you were hearing the truth. And uh, with the passing of the aeon or something, the death of the pagan gods, this phenomenon faded out. However, it is still available uh, and you found thr it. through the mediation of these compounds. Now, how can you say these same words how can you say them and have people feel like they want to invite you to dinner to tell of this doom and destruction of mankind and the toppling of science, especially when it is only right now science, scientific people will understand what you're saying? Well, see, what I'm saying is if we would intelligently examine these dimensions that the psychedelic drugs make available, we could, as it were, get in touch with the oversoul and, and leave the era when man is disciplined by flying saucers and messiahs and progress is halted for millennia at a stretch just because people can't evolve their ethics and their technology at the same rate of speed. If we would have a dialogue with the other, we would understand all these things and become in contact with the Tao of the ancestors. And, uh, you know, this is what a shamanic civilization or a shamanic culture is. It's where certain people mediate the group racial experience that is available somehow deployed in mind space. Have you, have you done a controlled experiment whereby you can bring a number of people to the College of Psilocybin or however it is that the message would come across. Have you done that? You mean in regard to triggering these UFO type experiences? Yes, have you been able to... Uh, well, only in the sense that uh, we've ascertained by questionnaire 
that uh, this is a very frequent motif, perhaps the most frequently mentioned motif ev uh, by people who take psilocybin recreationally, is that it's about outer space and flying saucers and aliens, little green men. And these are people who are taking, you know, 15 milligram type doses, sufficient doses to elicit the full spectrum of the compound. DMT is similar. I mean, it conveys you into an elf-infested space where, uh, you know, wild and zany things are going on. It's as though there are continuum a reality that is beyond this reality, linguistically as well as spatio-dimensionally, so that you have to turn to a different language channel and then with this language pouring through your head you observe the other place the alternate reality and it is that's what sanskrit says too mm -hmm. yes although this alternate reality is surprisingly far from most traditions about what alternative realities are like i mean it doesn't prepare you for its crackling electronic hyperdimensional interstellar extraterrestrial saucerian mighty peculiar all this these highly polished and curved surfaces and machines and beings and language transformations and machines undergoing geometric transformations into beings and thoughts that condense as visible objects. This is a theme that's very interesting to me, is the, uh, the hyper-dimensional language, a language that is, uh, uh, fulfills philo Judaeus quest for the more perfect logos. Philo said that a more perfect logos would be beheld rather than heard. And this is what happens on DMT. You hear a language which is very faint and far away. And as it gets louder and louder, you realize that without ever going over a quantized transition, it is becoming a phenomenon not of the audio field, but of the visual field. And that it is, in fact, a fully evolving synesthetic hallucination of extremely realistic and utterly bizarre... Uh, Proportion. I mean, it's like an Arabian maelstrom of color and form, and you somehow sense, you know, that you're in the Sistine Chapel, you're at the Kaaba, you're at Konarak, you're at all these places, and but you know, it's a hyperdimensional infundibulum, if you will. <laughs> it's just a little place to dance, and uh, then you see, you know, that there is alien information. This Saucerian information is deployed everywhere in this other space. And that the really astonishing thing is that uh, human history and art uh, reflect so little of it. But it does. You do see it. You, oh, you see it, but uh, very, you have very to see faintly. It to see it, though. When you see the real thing, yeah, you they, just you think, see it elsewhere. "My God!" I mean, how do they keep the lid on this stuff? This is raging right next door, and. Uh, you know, the modern epistemological methods are just not up to dealing with an elf, with chattering elf-infested spaces. I mean, we have a word for those spaces. We call it schizophrenia and slam the door. But, you know, these, uh, these dimensions have been with us since 10,000 times longer than Freud. And uh, people just have to come to terms with them. Now, it's uh, because of an ac accidents of botany and history History. European man has been away from the psychedelic dimension since uh, a while, you know, from the uh, dimension of the tryptamines and psilocybin since perhaps the closure of the last glaciation. So now we've accomplished marvelous things with techne and this and that. But here it is, uh, you know, many cultures around the world have kept the flame burning and the, the uh, discs which haunt the skies of Earth indicate that the unconscious cannot be kept waiting forever. These things are going to have to be dealt with. Uh, and what it seems to me to point out is, you know, that the, 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 the imagination really is the ground of being. And this is the great discovery which will change things. It will be as if man had discovered fire for the second time. 
the imagination is the uh, the golden pathway to everywhere and when we cease to try and cross to the stars by uh, crude rocket and engineering schemes and realize that deployed in the imagination is the entire universe and I that to go about uh, instigating uh, the launch off Launch. Well, you have to. The, I think what the task of history can now be seen to be is what I call turning man inside out. The body has to be uh, ex interiorized, and the soul has to be exteriorized to create, uh, you know, a golden disc. A uh, how by magic. <laughs> This matter of the flying saucer gives me an excuse to read a favorite poem of mine which answers your question about the future of man and the psychedelic experience. He says, Once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. And this is the idea of becoming, you know, a golden object after what death. Yeats, this is sailing to Byzantium. Once, once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. In other words, a golden bird, a hyperdimensional object of Grecian gold enameling. With and the and this is what the flying saucer is. It is the soul become object. This is the secret of alchemy. Uh, it's interesting, you see, that the great flowering of alchemy, the great last flowering of alchemy in the 16th century, was coincident upon a level of understanding of uh, natural chemistry approximately equal to our modern understanding of the role of life in the universe. In other words, mostly speculation. So that what for us moves off into the sky as the flying saucer told to us to be possible by science but highly unlikely is like the 16th century mind's relationship to the uh, philosopher's stone, which was said to be highly unlikely but not impossible. And so all this imaginative effort was exhausted in trying to produce the Philosopher's Stone. And the focus was upon chemical hardware, heating alembics, watching swirling gases in cloudy glass. And now in the modern context, it has gone into the sky. The sky is the dimension of the other for 20th century man. We feel we understand natural chemical processes. There is no mystery there. Miners no longer encounter gnomes when they go into deep mines the way they did in the 15th and 16th century. Those gnomes have been stilled, but the sky is still haunted. This is where we are told it might be too. possible for it to come from, and the sea, and the sea is obviously uh, co-mapped to the unconscious. But the sky, because our scientists tell us, you know, that somewhere out there, just possibly, it might be so. But I think what's being missed is that the whole dimension of uh, communication is being ruled uh, inadmissible as evidence simply because it doesn't conform to the epistemological biases of the people who are asking the question. And that is all these voices in the head that guide shaman, that obsess lunatics, that uh, make poetry, and uh, in other words, the muse, the muse is real. I mean, if you have not experienced the muse, that doesn't mean anything. You may not have climbed Mount Everest either. But I tell you, out there in life, there are experiences which uh, 
cause a need for new definitions. And uh, the everyone has had them, whether they're willing to admit it. I think of one sort or another. An intimation of yes. the other. Uh-huh. Well, so imagine a compound which elicits this uh, when you choose to use it. Well, one could talk endlessly about this subject, I suppose, but uh, until it's resolved, all of man's epistemological dealings with reality will be haunted by this faint spookiness which can't be gotten rid of. So to start off uh, this continuation of the discussion of flying saucers, I'll read Yeats uh, again. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. And it's that phrase, the artifice of eternity, which... uh, again invokes uh, this strange mechanistic yet spiritualistic future into which the archetype of the flying saucer is calling people. You see, what's happening is man is becoming a uh, transplanetary creature and this is something which takes about 10,000 years from the first, uh, you know, the earliest machines to leaving the planet. And it... Give it, give or take, 3,000 <laughs> either way. But it is, as H.G. Wells said of history, it is a race between education and catastrophe because uh, these more and more destructive chemical and atomic processes are released as the species realizes its aspirations are alien to the ecology of the planet and that it and the planet must part. And this is the, the transformation of man into a space faring race is on a biological scale the great event that history is about. I mean the coming of agriculture, the coming of urbanization, these things are peanuts compared to the what is going to happen to this species, to these monkeys as they leave the planet with their computers and their atomic physics and all this. I mean you see what is happening and why the psychedelic experience is so important is because uh, information is loose on planet three. Some kind of very strange thing is going on. The world is not made of quarks or electromagnetic wave packets or the thoughts of God. The world is made of language and language is replicating itself in DNA which at its culmination is creating uh, societies of civilized and intelligent beings which possess languages, which possess cybernetic which possess machines, which use languages, so that uh, standing off a light year or two from this system, what seems to be happening, what is unusual about Earth, is that language literally has become alive. It is infested matter. It is replicating and defining and building itself, and it is in us. My voice speaking is a monkey's mouth making little mouth noises that are uh, carrying agreed upon meaning and it is the meaning without the meaning you only have little mouth noises the meaning is a crude form of telepathy because as you listen to my voice my thoughts become your thoughts and we compare them and there is what's called communication understanding uh, It's all about codes, and that's why I've said at times the flying saucer problem is like a grammatical problem. It's like a dangling participle in the fourth dimensional language which makes reality, and that's why it's not reducible to any of these uh, very simple-minded approaches. It is somehow embedded in the machinery of epistemic knowing itself. So we won't be able to find it if we go out in rocket ships. No, it is, it, is, uh, it is within. It is the soul of man. We won't be able to find it until we somehow come to terms with uh, the hidden part, you know, the unconscious, the collective unconscious, the overmind, the fact that there is a 
level of hierarchical control being exerted by the human species as a whole, that the destiny of man is not in the hands of governments and corporations and communist party apparatchiks. It is uh, in the hands of a weirdly democratic, amoeboid-like, hyper-intelligent superorganism, which is called uh, everybody. And uh, as we come to terms with this, as we take our place embedded in the body of everybody and information flows more freely and the reality of this informational creature is seen more clearly. The fact that we are, it, it's an organism. We are having a symbiotic relationship with an, an organism made of information. And this is uh, what psychedelics uh, reinforces, I think, very strongly. It's in the psychedelic dimension that you finally can key in to the voice of the organism and say, hey, what's happening? And then it explains to you that things are not as you took them to be at all and that there is, in fact, layer and layer and layer upon interlocking meaning and that there's very little else other than that and that the imagination is the true ground of being, and that there is a uh, dimension parallel to time, outside of time, that is accessible to you as much as you want it to the degree that you can decondition yourself from the history-bound cognitive systems that have carried you to that point. This is why it's been, always been said of psychedelics <coughs> that they were... Or, uh, Socio, uh, sociological catalysts. For the shaman. Well, the shaman <clears throat> brings the message to the tribe. Yes, but it's a the tribe is a system set up to receive the message. We have a different way of doing it, which What's is that? that power elites in political control pass down state-approved philosophies, which are then applied, and this runs quite. The state is shaman. The state as shaman, the state as mediator of God's holy will, um, rather than a, a personal, a Protestant approach, if you will, a personal relationship to the overmind. Uh, and the flying saucer, what it represents basically is uh, an instance of crisis between the individual and the overmind, where the overmind breaks through the oppressive screen thrown around it and comes to meet the individual. And it is, you know, like an interview with an angel or a demon. It's very, very laden with uh, heavy psychological resonances for the person experiencing it. It is a numinous experience. It is... Isn't uh, every moment of recognizable creation then falling into that... Uh, category of the seepage from the overmind where you get a synthesis of uh, information which becomes your creative thought, your discovery. Yes, well our theory of time basically mapped the idea that novelty was what you call this standing wave of eternity and that it seeps into time at a variable rate which can actually be mathematically described using the I Ching and, and other techniques. It's that sort of thing, yes. It's as though, you know, where the flying saucers come from is eternity. They don't come from the stars unless space in eternity encompasses the idea of being able to move instantly to and from the stars. But the flying saucers come from a dimension, you could almost say they come from beyond death. They come from a dimension somehow totally different from our own, but tied up. With, the, uh, with human psychology and human psyche in a way that is puzzling and alarming and reassuring. And uh, shaman, it's very hard. This is a question uh, to what degree non-participants in 20th century civilization perceive this, meaning people who take mushrooms but have nothing to do with 20th century society, whether they accept that always, since Paleolithic time, this super-futuristic dimension has been present so that in any century people could have had this commerce with the end of time, with the far future, with the place where, as James Joyce said, man becomes dirigible. 
the place where you know we have bootstrapped ourselves to the point where we leave the planet, leave the monkey shell, leave all earthbound conceptions of ourselves behind and push off into the pure imagination. Scary. Scary. Gnostic, perhaps, as someone said. It sounds like megalomania to me, Martha. <laughs> But, you know, the future always, I mean, how, uh, how mad would the 20th century have sounded recited to anyone in the 19th? It, what it comes down to is uh, trying to have faith that man is good, because what's happening is that whatever man is, man is taking control of the definition of being human, so that through genetic engineering, through drug design, through probing of you know these weird psychedelic dimensions, through cybernetic interface, through activation of information, man is going to become a mirror of his deepest aspirations. And the question then becomes, what are man's deepest aspirations? You know, what will it be? Is it some kind of Mephistophelian nightmare? Is it the Nietzschean Superman come back to haunt us in a way that makes the Third Reich look like a picnic? Or is it, uh, you know, the element of care and uh, control, the aesthetic element, the wish yeah. to escape into an, a universe that is in fact art? This is what it holds out, that man could become uh, an inhabitant of his own imagination. Because with the technology for space, uh, for building large habitats in space, it is possible to imagine the complete galaxy of science fiction created in a sphere less than 12 light hours in diameter with the sun at the center of it, so that you would have 50 or 60,000 independent habitats pursuing social experiments of every sort spatially independent, doing very long-term slow orbits from the sun and the outer planets, but informationally linked in a bubble of time, 12 light hours in diameter. And the current engineering thinking on building these large habitats is that uh, right now you could produce the Hawaiian environment six, uh, up to 14 light hours from the sun, which is several light hours further out than Pluto. So that means that essentially the entire solar system has become habitable real estate. If we can simply transform the human imagination to realize that uh, Getting high is not a metaphor. Getting high is what the whole ball game is about. That, uh, you know, it's true that the earth is the cradle of mankind, but you don't remain in the cradle forever. And this is what beckons the... It's been, you know, only 25, 30, 50,000 years since our shamanic ancestors began to munch the mushrooms and glimpse the vision of man radiating out through the galaxy as a perfected, super-intelligent force for light. And uh, this is the 15-round slug-out uh, leading to whether or not that happens or not. Now, Timothy Leary maintains hmm. similar positions from a different... Similar but different. But, yeah. but right. He, but I mean, he talks a lot about the DNA. I'm not... Well, it's the DNA on one level. The genetic information is sh stored in DNA, where these visionary worlds, the information that allows them to be just uh, shown to you like movies hour after hour, where that information is stored is, I think, a very, very interesting question and certainly a challenge to molecular enthusiasts of molecular uh, memory models. Well, now, uh, is it not so that the muse is a sort of a catalyzing of the imagination? In Precisely. Way, the it's an ecstasy. So and the claim is made that these things can be attained various ways, but uh, there are many different kinds of ecstasis. I think the peculiar... Uh, spacey, extraterrestrial dimension that these tryptamines convey you into is not the standard ecstasy of the mystics, or we would have uh, more of a reflection of that in our literature. In fact, one of the things most puzzling to me is why the, uh, the bizarre motifs of the DMT flash have not uh, made their way into any culture anywhere, as far as I'm aware. 
Well, um, would that make either an image of people being fearful of the of these um, visions when they have them, and so keeping them undercover, or an idea that they might be going insane in some way? I mean, what is the the uh, yes, way out of that? Well, I think the change is so radical and the implications so hard to digest that you're right. People either feel their own sanity is being threatened or they recognize it as a challenge to the, to the uh, reality myth of their society and so they just repress it. They have very little to do with it. It's very hard to, uh, to contact these contradictory realities which throw into doubt everything you know about the reality you're inhabiting. I mean, what a strange, strange world it is if there are these alternative continui operating all around us, uh, filled with strange alien information floating around, and yet uh, why, uh, why pose it in the uh, in the future, it is so that this is what's going on. It's just then how much time you care to spend thinking about it. Uh, well, these are science fiction theories too. I mean, one comes across this smattering here and there, and um, you are saying that it's actual, and this is the way it is. This is your mission, basically, your rap. Yes, well, I'm not saying it's only the way it is, but I am certainly saying that uh, these tryptamine drugs elicit an experience that is extremely peculiar, that has more relationship with the UFO experience than with classical mystical experience or other hallucinogenic drugs, and that... Um, societal attitudes and other things have conspired to uh, uh, keep this under wraps. It has not been well looked at and yet uh, basically because people who are interested in flying saucers are not interested in drugs, the great majority of people interested in flying saucers are hardware nuts and just for sure want to prove that it's a machine from Zeta Reticuli, you know, just nuts and bolts. And uh, the, the psychological explanation is not welcome anywhere particularly. Meanwhile, the community of drug researchers feels they're laboring under enough of a stigma to not ally themselves with flying saucer people, which is just like uh, adding an albatross to an anchor. So, uh, you know, it's not a, a popular point of view. So since I'm outside of all of that, I can just say, you know, I read Iliad on shamanism and, you know, I think these people did a fine job, and but I don't catch the flavor from any of this orthodox anthropological reporting on shamanism that anybody has really come to grips with how strange the psychedelic experience is and that it poses problems not only for these so-called primitive people who use it and are being studied, it poses fundamentally uh, equally deep problems for our society. That we can no more assimilate the content of the psychedelic psychedelic experience than can a villager in the New Guinea Highlanders or a Witoto in the Amazon. In fact, we have less of a basis for coming to terms with it. So our culture is in, in a very uh, desperate crisis, a birth crisis, a terminal crisis. Uh, if, if we are not fully informed as to the nature of reality, we should correct that oversight. And this is my motivation. Well, I'm disappointed that we can't um, greet our other. Well, I guess you greet your other uh, when you meet them in that dimension. And Have you ever gone anywhere with another human to these places and actually been able to, say, have a parallel experience? experience? Well, I think that happens uh, certainly in taking ayahuasca with with groups of people in the Amazon where the shaman is singing, you definitely have the feeling that uh, you're all being carried through the same space and being shown the same things. And when you take psilocybin just with one other person, you're lying together 
be mushroomed, as Gordon Lawson says. Uh, you have the feeling, you know, that you're just flowing there together. And sometimes you can even, one person can describe and then leave off and the other one can begin to describe and it's all flowing together. And yes, t I am totally convinced that, that telepathy occurs on these drugs. I'm not sure how to go about making it a repeatable phenomenon, but uh, it certainly happens. You see, psilocybin was made illegal just as an afterthought. When in the panic, when everything was being made illegal, it never had any hearing or was, uh, you know, examined by itself. It was just a hallucinogenic agent, therefore illegal. But uh, for for throwing a light on the psyche, for uh, for catapulting the imagination into these futuristic spaces, it needs to be uh, looked at very closely. How do you see it being organized in order to uh, educate people? Well, we need to have uh, what's always been lacking in psychedelic research is uh, uh, an examination of the content of the experiences. So we need to give it to very intelligent people who are willing to work with it, not in a clinical setting, but in a setting where you ask the question, how does it change people's lives when they uh, can be involved in it in a open, non-stressed sort of environment? We found that going into the Amazon, which is not exactly a non-stress-filled environment, that as we would go up these jungle rivers and inevitably contact small villages where the mushrooms would be available, that, you know, reality is transformed. Reality truly is made of language and of linguistic structures which you hold unbeknownst to yourself in your mind and which, under the influence of psilocybin, just begin to dissolve and you begin you begin to perceive, right, beyond the unspeakable, you, the contours of the unspeakable begin to emerge into your perception. And you can't say much about the unspeakable, and yet it can color everything you do. You live with it. It is the invoking of the other. The other has become the self. All these various forms of estrangement are healed. That's why it's so, you know, that the term alien has these many connotations. What's the next step? Well, the next step is to confirm some of what I've said, to uh, uh, form a consensus among a group of researchers, to then try and uh, uh, figure out a strategy, chemical or otherwise. Who would you invite? To, to work to on a problem like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, people like Frank Barr, um, Sasha Shulgin, my brother, John Lilly, if he would behave himself. <laughs> All these great uh, people, you know, would have a great interest in this. This is the question that has not been dealt with. The botany has been dealt with, the taxonomy, the chemistry. How would you set it up? How would I set it up? Well, we need to uh, explore this linguistic phenomenon somehow. Uh, specifically, I think, not by giving drugs to volunteers, but by giving drugs to the researchers who are going to actually grapple with the problem. Because all this talk that orbits around the psychedelic experience by scientists, how many of them have had a psychedelic experience? So you would do it with people who have already had, or you would try to get un... I think the early approach with psychedelics, which was the Baconian approach, the logical approach, uh, was the correct one, which is very intelligent, thoughtful people should take psychedelics and try and understand what's going on. Not batteries of prisoners, uh, not uh, school children, uh, but intelligent people. And uh, 
share their experiences. See, I say it's too early for a science. What we need now are like the diaries of explorers. We need many diaries of many explorers so we can begin to get a feeling. Uh, the hit I get off of it is that it is very important for human culture, that it is no coincidence that this is coming to Western man just as we acquire the technological capability to leave the planet, that the mushroom and the transformation of the human image by going into space are all things that are spun together, that nothing less is happening than the emergence of a new... Metamorphosis. Yes, a new human order, a, a telepathic, uh, humane, universalist kind of human culture is emerging, which will make everything which preceded it be the Stone Age. Will the overview, monad, uh, oversoul, whatever, reassume the personality knowledge that's gained within one lifetime and therefore that is what you see as a UFO reincarnation? Or would you say that uh, it's uh, terminated at that terminal's termination? In other words, the personality which inhabits your form is when that license is up, it reforms itself and that the form is what the personality is carried by. Well, the, when consciousness is finally understood, it means that the absence of consciousness will be understood, which means the study of consciousness leads inevitably to the study of death. Death is both a historical and individual phenomenon about which we as monkeys have great anxiety. But what the psychedelic experience seems to be pointing out is that actually the reductionist view of death has missed the point and that there is something more. It isn't simple extinction, that the universe does not build up such complex forms as ourselves without conserving them in some astonishing and surprising way that is perhaps related some way to the intuitions that we have from the psychedelic experience. The UFO comes from this murky region beyond the end of history, beyond the end of life. It is both super, super historical and supra-organic. It is uh, uncanny, alien. It raises the hair on the back of your neck. It is both the apotheosis and the antithesis of the monkey's journey toward mind. It is like the mind revealing itself. This is what all religion is about, is uh, shock waves given off by this event at the end of history, which we are now very close to and which psilocybin can uh, help us to understand because it conveys you into the uh, place where it is happening constantly, where the, uh, the millennium is a standing wave in eternity, not an anticipation. And so the mushroom stands uh, at the end of history. It's an object that pulls all history toward itself. It's a causal force that operates to us backwards through time. It's why things happen the way they do, because everything is being pulled toward a nexus of transformation.